My name is Jim Doty. I'm the founder and director of Seacare, which is a secular organization that is very interested in understanding the neuroscience of compassion. That being said, we do know certain truths. We know that there are individuals who have for uh, millennia been attempting through great introspection to understand how the mind works. And it is through this introspection that we have learned a great deal. It has allowed for transformation. And only now is science catching up and validating uh, some of these old truths. For those of you who may not know Eckhart Tolle, uh, which I think there are probably very few in this room, uh, his groundbreaking book, uh, The Power of Now, which uh, uh, Oprah uh, did a 10-part series, which over, I think, 35 million people watched and was very powerful, uh, then followed by A New Earth, Stillness Speaks, and a variety of other books. Eckhart's insights, his... Uh, understanding of self, the great introspection has been very powerful. Uh, and this has led him to teach literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of individuals, gain insights into their own lives and transform them for the better. So tonight we're going to have a little conversation. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to learn a great deal. Uh, I first met Eckhart in June of 2009 where uh, we were together down at the uh, Global Alliance for Transfor Transformational Entertainment. Now, uh, this was uh, the entertainment industry. I'm still waiting for the global transformation of entertainment, <laughs> but it was a wonderful star. <laughs> and then uh, we met again uh, with His Holiness up in uh, Vancouver uh, at a peace dialogue. So without further ado, because I know you have not that much interest in hearing me, uh, we'll start our conversation. Before we do so, though, I would really just like to sit down for a moment, and maybe we can just close our eyes and take a few bit breaths for a minute to put us in the right state so that we can really listen and be present. So just relax and take a few deep breaths and think about being here and who you are and us spending time together. I think we'll start. So Eckhart and I had a wonderful pre-talk conversation. Uh, one of the things we were talking about was, um, and I, one of the things I, I was saying I was interested in is what happens in people's lives that lead to changes or transformations. And I was going to ask Eckhart to maybe tell us about what it was in your own life or a little background about your life that uh, resulted in ultimately, if you will, a transformation or a great insight? Mm. Well, um, <clears throat> unhappiness, basically, uh, intense unhappiness, sometimes called depression, anxiety, periods of anxiety, depressions, throughout my 20s and even in childhood I was already predominantly unhappy. I remember when uh, we lived in a three or four story building and when they were painting the outside of the building they built a scaffolding. I was about six and I thought oh we lived on the ground floor so well as long as there's a scaffolding I have no problem whenever I want to commit suicide I can just climb up and jump down so I'll be okay as long as the scaffolding is there that's my way out that shows the degree of unhappiness <laughs> um, and then 
at 29, I just, it became more and more acute. And uh, one night, I, the thought came into my head. I describe it very briefly at the beginning of the power of now, in the middle of the night. I can't live with myself any longer. There was in such intense unhappiness and uh, the depression it was just too much to take. At that moment, uh, an inner separation happened. I couldn't have explained exactly at that time, but it, retrospectively I can explain now what happened because I understand it. I didn't then. An inner s separation happened between the unhappy self and my a deeper sense of I or beingness, which I now call consciousness itself. So I had been identified throughout my life with an unhappy mind-made entity consisting of self-images and, and ideas and self-talk in the mind. It's the self-talk that most people are familiar with, but in my case it was particularly destructive and unpleasant. But everybody is familiar with the self-talk in the head, I sometimes call it the voice in the head, uh, which are quite simply the automatic, uh, compulsive, one could say, thought processes that never stop, that uh, either comment on your sense perception, whatever is happening around you, a running commentary, uh, you might recognize that, it might be familiar to you. Uh, if you don't recognize it, then you're so identified it, with it that you don't even know that you have a running commentary on your life. You be become the running commentary in your life. Uh, in other words, that, as happened to me, become totally identified with the compulsive thinking that never stopped. That voice in the head that in my case, was predominantly negative. And so the emotions that then I felt continuously were the reflection of the predominantly negative self-talk about myself, about other people, about the situation I found myself in. There was ample justification for negative self-talk because I was struggling, I didn't have enough money, I was trying to prove myself, working too hard, had problems with... Uh, couldn't find a girlfriend, was too shy, all kinds of twisted up inside. <laughs> and uh, so I basically there was this unhappy me, but I, at that night I disidentified from it and stood back from it, so to speak, and I suddenly thought, uh, this thought that came to mind, I can't live with myself any longer. There was a stepping back from the thought and I thought, are there two of me or one? What does that mean? I can't live my, with myself. Who am I and who or what is that self that I cannot live with? Then that thought brought about the separation and then there was an I and then this unhappy me was somehow recognized as not real. But, uh, but at that time I couldn't have explained it. I, it was this very strange experience. All I can say is the next morning I woke up feeling totally at peace and just waking, opening my eyes, looking around the room and everything seemed fresh and new. The light coming through the curtains, the most the simplest objects lying in the table had a certain presence, a benign, wonderful presence to them. Everything I acknowledged and it was lovely and there was this underlying peace. And I said, what, what is this? And then I got, I was living in London at the time, I, was, I got on a bus uh, even going through central London on the bus, everything seemed so, pe all the people running around the city, everything was so peaceful. I said, this is so strange. <laughs> and, and then I, I bought a, a di um, notebook and I started a diary and I started with this first entry was, I don't know what happened to me, but it's something weird. I just have to write this down in case I lose it again. <laughs> <laughs> But somehow it stayed with me. It didn't, the, the intensity had variations in it of the, the piece, but basically there was always since then always some piece in the background of my life. <laughs> so that was the, a shift in consciousness. And much later when I started to investigate 
other spiritual traditions, Buddhism and mystical Christianity, Gnosticism, Sufism, Zen Buddhism, uh, also the great Hindu teachers. Gradually, I began to understand that what happened to me, they call awakening or spiritual awakening. <laughs> and so the, the understanding wasn't there. There was just the experience of it at first. Do you think that, you know, a lot of uh, people in the West are doing, if you will, mindfulness practices. And uh, the idea is to, if you will, uh, it's quite often very difficult to stop the talk, but uh, being able to not respond to the talk. And is it, do you think, once you, because it takes so much energy to constantly be distracted, that suddenly when you don't have that, you have now the ability to actually respond yes. and, and feel the senses and the perceptions. Yes. So most of the, the self-talk, the voice in the head, is conditioned by one's past, is conditioned by one's education, one's upbringing, the culture you've been brought up in, and many personal factors, your parents and so on, all these makes up the kind of talk that, that happens in your head. Uh, a great step forward is already to realize that there is a voice in your head that talks all the time. <laughs> because that's a, that really, I would say that it's the first glimpse of an awakening, because to realize that there is a a continuous self-talk happening, a lot of it totally unnecessary, by the way, it, I mean, we're not talking about the thinking that is helpful and useful and can solve problems in your life and create new things. The mind is potentially a wonderful tool to be able to use in that way. But for many people, the mind is a kind of torture instrument 80% of their lives. And they would be much happier and much more productive without the self-talk. So the first realization is that there is a voice and that I call it the first awakening because you, that means something else has come in. A, we could call that a, another dimension of consciousness has come in, which we could call awareness. I sometimes call it awareness. We could call it presence. And I think in Buddhist terminology, that would be called mindfulness. I personally don't use the term, although I, it's a wonderful thing, mindfulness. I don't use the term because it implies that your mind is full, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually realizing there there are there and this is the beginning of realizing there are two, there are two dimensions of consciousness possible in you. One is the dimension of thinking, which is great, but a more a more vital and deeper dimension is the dimension of simple awareness, where there is which means consciousness when you think. Consciousness takes on a particular form. Every thought is a thought form. It's an energy formation. Uh, I'm not a scientist, you're a scientist, but I think if, uh, if you're totally honest as a scientist, you will probably admit- Don't ask for too much. No, <laughs> you, you will probably admit that, that science even now doesn't quite know what a thought is. Uh, no, you're, you're uh, absolutely correct. In uh, fact, the more we pretend we know, uh, confirms reality that we don't, uh, I think. <laughs> so uh, it's, my approach is not scientific, but I think there's a lot to be said for looking at it from a scientific angle. But my approach is totally um, experiential. So you can see for yourself, find for yourself, there is that voice. And then you become aware that that voice has certain patterns to it, repetitive thought patterns that tend to occur again and again, perhaps every day of your life. I had thoughts for years. I had certain thoughts like uh, whenever something happened that wasn't good, I had a thought that would comment on it in my mind and it would say, of course, bad things always happen to me. It's bound to happen to me. It's, of course, always bad things happen to me. And they did. <laughs> so it always confirmed that I was right. And, <laughs> and uh, then with a disidentification, realize there is a space of you from where you can be aware what kind of thoughts are going through your mind all the time. And that the awareness of thought is not a thought. It's simply the ability to look at a thought like a light shining on a thought. And I call that 
pure or unconditioned consciousness, whereas the thought is consciousness that has become a form. An analogy we could use is to say that uh, consciousness is the vast ocean and thinking is the waves and ripples on the surface of the ocean. And every wave and ripple has a very short-lived life. It's very fleeting, like every thought, but it pretends to have an independent existence. And, and then what happens is this continuous identification with the stream of thinking leads to a very serious dysfunction in one's sense of identity, because then your sense of who you are, your sense of I-ness, is derived, your sense of self, is derived from whatever your mind is telling you about yourself, or ideas, opinions, viewpoints about yourself. In other words, your sense of who you are is derived from thought. And that was recognized already by the ancient teachers like the Buddha as erroneous, an illusion. There is, it is in all the ancient teachings expressed in different words, there is a deeper sense of self possible to humans that is not thought, where you, are, where you truly sense yourself, but not as a story in the head. So you no longer derive your identity from something you are telling yourself in your head, which is extremely limiting, and we call that in spiritual terms ego. It's not quite the same way in which Freud uses ego. So this is the, in, when we use, spiritually use the word ego, basically means complete identification with the stream of thinking and complete absence of awareness. So you are, you are then, it's not only the thinking, of course, then what you say and what you do, your actions, are totally controlled by the conditioned mind, conditioned by the past, reactive patterns. So this is how many people, they relive or live out their parents' unconsciousness, how the, the, the faulty upbringing, the dysfunctional upbringing for their parents, they then inflict it on their children. It often goes back many, many generations, similar dysfunctional patterns. So you inherit, the conditioning is inherited, it occupies your mind until somebody comes and says, you told me before we met, this happened to you, you had a very dysfunctional upbringing, and then it can happen, the buck stops here, and your awareness suddenly comes in, and you are no longer forced to reenact the old conditioning of your mind. And for this to stop, this awakening needs to happen, and that basically is the essence of spiritual awakening, which is sometimes misinterpreted. People think spiritual awakening is when you suddenly see, I suddenly saw the angel came towards me, <laughs> or as you say, God spoke to me. Uh, mostly it's your mind, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so the, it's... You're going to say something? No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I, I was just holding on to every word, and I was waiting for it to come out, and then you stopped. Was... So the uh, it's um, the the wonderful thing is it's it's not that difficult, really, to step out of the stream of thinking. To um, one way, of course, is meditation. It's a tr the traditional approach is. You have certain periods of time, once or twice a day, when you sit down, close your eyes, and instead of involuntarily being drawn into the continuous stream of thinking, you usually in, with meditation you have a technique or method, you focus your attention on one thing, which could be a mantra that you repeat, it could be your breathing, it's a very ancient meditation. It could be the inner feeling in your body, the uh, sense of aliveness that pervade, pervades your body. In other words, you take attention away from thinking. And that's already a great realization that you are able, you have a, actually have a choice of directing attention. You don't have to go you don't have to go with your attention all the time where the habitual thought <coughs> patterns want you to go. The, the habitual thought patterns want your attention every time. Every thought says, I matter, Pick, give me your attention, follow me, they go this way. And another negative thought, and another one, and another one. Yeah, you know, I was just going to comment now yeah. I'll say something. 
<laughs> you know, uh, there was a great analogy made getting to what you earlier were talking about, which is you can't let yourself out of prison unless you actually know you're in prison. Yes. And I think that's, that's yes. really the key. Yes. So if your environment it completely surrounds you and you're always there, you don't even have a recognition that you're not there. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting because for my, myself, and uh, Eckhart and I were talking earlier about, and he was just talking about this event where he woke up, but if you think about what happens to uh, a number of people who have engaged either in chronic negative thought, often manifested by negative behavior, they get so down, and this is like an addict, right? They, they finally get to very bottom, and it's either they're going to die or there has to be this transformation. And this is when you see these sudden, I think, breaks that can give you insight or unfortunately sometimes can lead to uh, death. But uh, I think we talk about <clears throat> these techniques to learn these things, to how to separate, if you will, that ego or that negative talk, and one is certainly mindfulness. But really, one of the things that's really interesting is how is it that the brain is able to do this in this one instant? And this is one of the things that I, I think, looking at the neuroscience of this, we're, we're trying to learn. Because you have spent, I know, and continue to spend many hours in introspection, and we have monks who spent 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 hours but I don't think many of us have the ability to spend 10 or 20 or 30,000 hours trying to get there. Can you? <laughs> okay. I don't think it's necessary to spend. Uh, meditation is a wonderful tool for many people, and even meditation is not necessary for everybody. Some people awaken spiritually without ever coming into contact with any meditation technique or any spiritual teaching. They, they, they awaken simply because they can't stand the suffering anymore. And then something inside them snaps suddenly and there is a disidentification from thinking. This, for example, has happened to people that I have met and known, people who uh, had a serious illness, fatal. They, they were told they only had a very limited amount of time to live. So it's almost as if future had been removed from them. And a lot of one's thinking is to do with what's the next thing that's going to happen. That's very common. <laughs> so, and when the future is removed, then kind of, or whenever you mentally project yourself to some future, every future, by the way, is, is a thought. The, except from a thought of future, there is no future because nobody's ever experienced the future. Uh, so uh, you can verify it for yourself because, okay, let's see if you can ever experience the future. No. So what is the future? A thought in your head, basically. <laughs> Without that, there's only ever the present moment. And what is the past? Except a thought in your head because for anything to be life, or being is actually inseparable from present moment. Nothing can be, exist, live that is not now. Nothing can live in the past and nothing can live in the future. No, so past and future are strongly connected with thinking. And uh, so if somebody, if you're being told that you basically have no future, yes, you could take refuge in the past and think only about the past, but what happens to these people who have been told sometimes that they have a very serious illness, only have a few more months to live, they are forced into the present moment because there's nothing else for them anymore. There is no more future to, to escape into mentally. So they are forced into the present moment, into what I call the state of presence, which is that state of being awake, and they go that means the entire mind-made sense of self, the egoic sense of self that, that, that is based on uh, conceptualization, collapses and, and there is an, something arises that is just pure awareness. And they go like, if I may act it out, <laughs> whereas before they were identified with it, or continuously with the thinking me, me, the self, me. Oh, so dreadful. 
And then they think it's only six more months to live is the worst fate that could happen to a human, and it could if you're in your thoughts. And then suddenly something snaps and they go out into, oh, there's only this moment. And so there's an intense awareness of the present moment. By chance, I read last week in the BBC news, there was an Eng there's an English pop uh, musician, I can't remember his name, unfortunately, who has just been told that he has uh, pancreatic cancer and has six months to live. And he said, and this is a very rare case, usually people go into deep suffering first before they come out of it, if they do. This man was told that he had pancreatic cancer and only a few more months to live, and he, he walked out of the doctor's office and he said he was total in a state of total exhilaration and elation because suddenly he was absolutely present and he looked at every, the bla every blade of grass and every little thing was intensely alive. He said, I've never lived like that. And why was I so worried about my problems all my life? Why did I miss all that? So he said it was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to him. And this is rare to immediately go there. But so there's a potential when you suffer. I've also had many letters, communications from people in prison who say my sentence is either life or my sentence is another 10, 20 years. And I have, I've read your books or I've listened to a talk and suddenly I realized something and I became totally peaceful. So several people in prison have gone there because they have stepped out of thinking and they realized the source of their unhappiness actually was not the actual situation, although normally it would be regarded as pretty bad to be stuck in a prison cell and even worse knowing that you're going to be in for another 20 years or the rest of your life. So they, they realized that ultimately their suffering was not due to the situation, but to the mental commentary about the situation. And so they re the mental commentary became so unbearable, it collapsed by either with the help of a spiritual teaching and sometimes by itself. And what remained was just a sense of pure presence, awareness, mindfulness. And, and that, that is the real, spiritual awakening when something emerges from within you that is deeper than who you thought you were, the, the personal sense of self. So the, personal, the person is still there, but one could almost say that something more powerful shines through the person. And so, but you don't, you don't have to wait for the diagnosis by the doctor or to be put in prison, maybe that's good news. <laughs> No, I don't think you, you either do you have to do 30,000 hours of meditation uh, or live in an ashram for 20 years. There's a, you can, once you get a glimpse of it, you can invite it into your life in daily life. I call it mini meditations and actually step out of thinking and into presence. If I may just go to a little example now, just for you to experience as you sit here. Um, you can play around as you sit here with your attention. You can direct your attention, for example, onto your visual perceptions, where this is the room, this is the speaker here, the lights, the ceiling. You can direct your attention into your hands. You can feel the aliveness in your hands. You can choose where your attention goes. It doesn't have to be in thinking. You can direct your attention into the feeling of your body on the chair. You can, so there's a choice of where you want to put your attention. And then you can direct your attention. If I ask you, what does it feel like to be you? This is a very strange question. Uh, now you may not know exactly where to direct your attention. I'm, and I'm not talking of the body, you. Of, an, of a deeper sense of beingness. What does it feel like to be you without remembering your history, not me, the person who had that kind of experience and that kind of, no, a deeper sense of the more, the more essential sense of I-ness, of beingness. What does that feel like? So I'm asking you to direct your attention to something very intangible, uh, 
but you may get a glimpse of what that intangible thing or no thing is. And the strange thing is, it is no different from the attention itself. So when you look for yourself with the spotlight of your attention, and then you realize the attention itself is it. That in other words, <laughs> you recognize yourself as the consciousness that was looking for yourself. <laughs> so uh, th this is a little bit paradoxical, but perhaps the truth often is paradoxical. So yeah, look, Jesus, I believe, talked about that, or it's misunderstood mostly I, in churches. I don't think I've heard, ever heard them, these words explained properly. He said, the kingdom of heaven, as we know, he said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Now, kingdom of heaven, these are words that are belong to a different time period. Uh, we don't, kingdom is not used that much anymore. I think if he lived nowadays, he would, instead of kingdom, he would have said, dimension and heaven refers to a sense of vastness or spaciousness so this is what is in many spiritual traditions the term heaven is used in many languages sky and heaven is the same word in English you have two words it's the vast expansiveness so there's the dimension of spaciousness as I call it so if we retranslate the words of Jesus into a modern term, the dimension of spaciousness is within you. And then Jesus said, uh, when they asked him, well, where, where, where is the kingdom of heaven and when is it going to come? Because they're always waiting for it to come. And he says, the kingdom of heaven does not, this is lit, by the way, this is a literal, literal from the Bible. The kingdom of heaven does not come with signs to be perceived. You cannot say, Ah, it's over here, or look, it's over there. For I tell you, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Uh, so he is pointing to that which you can never make into an object of consciousness, like everything else. You can say, here's the table. It, the table becomes an object in consciousness. A thought that arises becomes an object in consciousness and then dissolves again. An emotion that you feel is an object in consciousness and then it dissolves again. But how is it possible for a sense perception even to be there, for an emotion to be felt or for a thought to be there? What is it that enables that to be there? It could not be there without the light of consciousness in which it appears. It appears in the light of consciousness. For example, you can doubt that the, where we are right here, that this is actually happening. And there have been many sages and philosophers who questioned the reality of our everyday experience and said, maybe it's all a dream. So philosophers said there's a dreamlike quality to our existence because every experience passes very quickly and it's gone. It's like a dream. So there is a dreamlike quality and we could sit here for hours and argue whether or not this is actually real. And of course, uh, Descartes, uh, had to, he, he sat down, Descartes sat down and said, what is it, is there anything that I cannot doubt? So he also looked at, okay, whether or not this table actually exists, I can doubt, because it may be a total misinterpretation of something else. Uh, obviously, if I looked at the atomic structure, I would no longer see a table. I would see mostly empty space, 99% empty space and a few atoms and molecules floating around, but we call it a table. And the same with your body. So we, you can doubt all that, that all that is real, or what is the thing in itself? Maybe can, other philosopher asked. So Descartes sat there and said, what, is there anything that I cannot doubt? And he was thinking and thinking and thinking. And then he said, ah, I'm always thinking. <laughs> I think, therefore I am. So he equated <clears throat> thinking with existence or beingness. If he had not stopped there and had waited a little longer and come to the end of thinking where he realized the answer has not been found through thinking and then reached the stage of thoughtless awareness, then he would actually have found the, the, the deeper truth of, of I am. <laughs> well, maybe we can chat about that for a moment where yeah. we talk about, if you will, the loss of ego in the spiritual context. <clears throat> we hear quantum... Physicists talk about quantum consciousness. We hear people talk about oneness. Uh, is 
once you separate out the thought, and there just is the is, is that the oneness we're talking about, or what are your thoughts? The <laughs> so we're using thought to point to something that's beyond thought. That's uh, uh, how it works. Not to the, uh, the the sense of separateness or separation arises through the continuous labeling of like your, all your life experiences. Uh, in, uh, which is particularly harmful in the case of other human beings. When you relate to other human beings, the moment you meet somebody, you again through this continue this stream of thinking that is involuntary and arises through your conditioning, will immediately interpret the other person with thoughts. They are called judgments, good or bad. More usually more negative than positive in most people's cases. <laughs> And that creates a sense of separation. Even when you walk in the forest or landscape and you immediately interpret everything, it, the reality that you inhabit becomes a conceptual reality. So you lose touch. It's as if a screen were suddenly arising between yourself and the aliveness around you in other human beings, in nature. So you cannot sense the inherent aliveness in nature anymore. And you cannot sense the inherent aliveness in another human being anymore because you reduce everything to mental concepts. So when you are totally, continuously immersed in, this, in the thinking, stream of thinking, you begin to inhabit a conceptual reality which separates you from the actual aliveness that's all around you. And that's so the source of separation, sense of separation, is... Uh, involuntary, continuous labeling of everything, and including yourself. You do it to yourself. You label yourself in certain ways. People have opinions about who they are, and they vary. Some people are predominantly negative, which is very unpleasant to live with a very self-critical mind that, that always says, well, why did you do that? You should have done better, and so on. Maybe it's your mother talking still, but it's thought. <laughs> Uh, so you have you have that. It's very it's a dreadful thing to have that in your head. So then you become you can become f free of that by realizing these are the thoughts and here's the, the the actual situation. I've lost the train of thought, by the way. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, can. We are talking about separation. So this is separation so he arises. He separated his I am that's from right. his thought. So that's how you do it. <laughs> separation then arises through that, and you can when you go into nature. Really, we can talk about it in terms of knowing. You can you can know. I like walking in nature in the forest, and I can I, I can do that in two ways. I can walk through the forest and look at the trees and birds and the ferns and all the wonderful things and comment on it and say, this is, it's that, it's called that, or look at this wonderful bird, I wonder what it's called, or, and so on, and all kinds of commentary. That's one way of knowing the forest, but I can also walk through the forest and simply be absolutely present and observe without labeling it. In that sense, from a conceptual point of view, I don't know anything anymore. But there is a deeper knowing there where I can suddenly sense something that the conceptual mind can never feel, and that is the forest is alive. There is an energy field there. There is even a sacredness there, and everything is intensely alive. And I become still, and, there's, and, and there is a sense of merging with that which you are observing with your sense perceptions. And so the sense of separation goes away, and, and there is a sense of oneness with that which you are perceiving. There's no longer the me and the other, because that's through conceptualization. And, when, and that's beautiful when you can walk in a forest like that. The experience of being in the forest is greatly enhanced. And if you can relate with another, to another human being like that, then there is a true relating. And here we come to compassion, I would say that true compassion with another human being, which is closely related to the ability 
to emphasize, to feel the beingness of the other, to sense your way into the other, uh, is also closely related to uh, what we could call goodwill towards another being, benevolence. Confucius already pointed to benevolence as one of the most important things. He said, you're not even fully human if the faculty of benevolence, which is goodwill, there are all the facets of the same faculty, has not arisen in you, Confucius said, you're not even fully human yet. So that compassion, the benevolence, the goodwill, the ability to empathize, to ultimately recognize the other as not absolutely other, all arises when the habitual and unconscious and compulsive labeling of others no longer operates. And that's where compassion can arise. We, we, before we came out, we were actually talking about uh, <clears throat> barriers to being compassionate or connecting to others. And we were actually uh, talking about how wonderful it is to have an animal, like a dog, uh, because they never judge you, right? And that's really what we all want. Yes. Because I think that's one of our fears is that when we intersect with another, we're going to be judged. And you have this animal that uh, unhesitantly uh, embraces you. And in, in fact, we were also talking about enlightened people or people who it's wonderful to be around. Not that they're dogs, but they're... Uh, <laughs> but what they do is, you, you, when you're with these people, you have this incredible sense they did just accept you for who you are with no judgment, uh, no demands. You're just there at that moment. And I think that's... Yes, yes. the dog of force is a wonderful example. People. We also talked about the GPS. GP the GPS doesn't judge you either, does it? Never raises its voice. This is right. The, the GPS uh, never tells you, why do you not listen to me? Why? <laughs> How many times why, how many times have I told you to turn this way? <laughs> so we're talking about writing a book, uh, Dogs and GPS. <laughs> but, and the dog, of course, uh, you, I don't know if you've heard the prayer, please, God, make me into the person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> <laughs> now, the dog, of course, the secret is the dog doesn't think. It just experiences you. It has no labels towards you. It doesn't have the conceptual reality. It has the direct reality. So there's this enormous joy of life in the dog as expressed in the tail, the wagging tail, which is, and, and this is why many human beings love relating to animals because they feel this unconditional acceptance. And you look into the eyes of a dog and there's, you can sense the dog's beingness unobstructed by mental stuff, that, that pure beingness. And by, by looking into the eyes of the dog and feeling the dog's beingness, actually you can sense your own beingness and you feel, oh, it feels so good to look into the dog's eyes. And so the dog, I would say, has, is, I would, uh, this is the, what I call it, the dog is pre-thought, so it hasn't lost him or herself, I don't like to call the dog it. Like the dog hasn't lost him or herself in the, the mental realm yet. And when we go beyond that, like you mentioned, like uh, people who don't have this egoic self anymore, they have a lot in common with the dog, but they have got, risen above thinking, and the dog is still below thinking. But but. Both are more deeply connected with that, that beingness than we are, we humans in our present, as I, the way I see it, in our present evolutionary stage, are halfway between, it's, we are, the way I see it, evolu in evolutionary terms, we are halfway between the animal and something greater than the human. <laughs> and that's one of the things actually we're talking about is one of the challenges for us which creates this uh, self-talk is the fact that we have a perception of a past with regret and a 
uh, fear of uncertainty by understanding a future. And so we have evolved from the animal, if you will, who's right there at the absolute moment and who experiences the joy and the connection and this incredible sense of, of happiness just for being right there, yet we have evolved to such an incredible state where we're either back there or looking over there, but we're not here. And I think that's yes. the challenge. Yes, that's an enormous restriction that we actually, most humans seem to live as if past and future were much more important than the present moment. And usually it's the case when you are up to a certain age, future is much more important. And when there's not that much future left anymore, the past <laughs> becomes much more important. Uh, you can all see that when you're older, your old grandfathers or parents, whatever, they start to talk more and more about the older they get, the more they talk about the past. Whereas you, most of you are young, probably tend to think more in terms of the next moment, the next and the next, it's not realizing that we actually, to a large extent, ignore, do not truly value, don't fully acknowledge, are not fully aligned with internally this moment, which is, and it's, a, it's not, is it a revolutionary statement to say, <laughs> there's only ever the present moment, that's all you ever have, not the future and not the past. You can never experience anything in the future. In that sense, the future will never come because when it comes, it's the present. There's only ever this moment. And if habitually you live in, uh, a, you, have, you have an antagonistic relationship with the present moment as many people have, and that's due to this continuous stream of thinking takes you out of the present moment, believing I need to get there because the fulfillment of my life is there, but never here. If that becomes a pattern, even if you achieve what you want, if the pattern is deeply lodged in your mind that I'm going to be fulfilled in the next moment or the one after that, that will probably remain even when you achieve certain things for a moment you'll be happy and fulfilled, and then the old pattern will re-emerge and you'll find unhappiness again. That happened to me shortly before, actually shortly before the shift in conscience happened to me. I was in London <laughs> at the, my finals came. I studied very hard. I was already a mature student because I left school at 14 and so, and then I got a job in my late teens and early 20s. And then I got the qualifications to get university in evening courses, and then I got was very fearful that I wasn't wouldn't do well, and I had to prove to the world and myself that I could do it, and so I worked very hard, and but was very unhappy while I was doing it most of the time, and I got the best in England. It's called a first class honors degree, which not many people get, and so of course elated. Well, I got wow. My life is now, this is the absolute climax of my life. And uh, that lasted for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the, 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 suddenly one night I woke up again in a state of fear. What's going to happen to me now? Uh, what do I do now? So the old pattern reasserted itself. And that was shortly before the shift happened. I became even more unhappy after that. So. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because I think uh, one of the things that happen is you, when you grow up and are acculturated, if you, I think that's a word, acculturated, uh, to certain patterns of thinking, certain self-criticisms, it's like an abused child, though, because that's in the environment. And, and there's this natural tendency, I think, and maybe you can comment on this, where when you're scared or fearful, you fall back on that because that's allowed you, I think, to survive to that point. It creates this construct that you think protects you uh, from harm when, in fact, it is the thing that is harming you. Yes, yes. So the, the talking about past and future and excessive emphasis on past and future in your life, yes, of course you need to have, it, there's nothing wrong with having a certain intention of what you want to achieve, take steps towards it. It's, it's part of living here in this dimension. 
You can't just say, I'm never going to plan anything anymore. Just take life as it comes. Well, some people try to do that, but they're not that happy either after a while. <laughs> uh, so then your life will get very diffused. And so to have an intention, to, have, to make a plan, perfectly fine. What, either a short-term plan, like I'm going to meet you tomorrow at 4 o'clock, how would you ever meet anybody if we didn't have time? And, and future on a practical level, of course it's needed. The question is whether future takes over your mind. Being able to use it for practical purposes is of course great, but I call that clock time is fine, but psychological time is when the future takes over your mind and your entire thought patterns are geared only towards future and you treat the present moment as either just a means to an end because it enables you to get to the next one. You're always reaching out, so to speak, internally to the next, yet never quite here, always looking for some fulfillment there. So you can never embrace the fullness of now, or you make the now into even an enemy. Some people are always unhappy. You, perhaps we all know some one or two people like that. Three. <laughs> We, who are, wherever they are, they are, they're complaining, it's never quite right. Wherever they are, or whoever they are with, after a little while, they're very uncomfortable again. It should be somewhere else. You know the bumper sticker that you see in some cars, in the various versions of it, says, I'd rather be golfing. And then another one says, I'd rather be fishing. I'd rather be this, I'd rather be there. When I visited the, the spiritual teacher, Ram Das, who lives in Hawaii, uh, he has a bumper sticker on it. Oh, Ram Das was the person who, in the 70s, wrote the book Be Here Now. That, and anyway, he has a bumper sticker on his car that says, I'd rather be here now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and, and then you realize you can actually, you can still pursue whatever an intention, where you want to get to, a plan, I call that, it's a bit like a journey. Your life is a, is a journey. You're going, you know you want to go from here to there. Whether you're going to get there, we don't know. Maybe on the way you'll branch out to somewhere else. But at least you have a certain direction. It's good to have some direction in your life. But while you are traveling, if the, the, your destination takes up most of your attention and you're continuously focusing on there, you miss all the journey, really. You can't enjoy the journey anymore. And most of your life is the journey. The arriving is relatively rare. The wedding, ah, the <laughs> and a few more graduation. Ah. But so, so those moments are not the fine few between. So the rest is the journey. And if you can't enjoy the journey, which means the step you're taking at this moment is really the most important thing. Yes, of course you know you're going that way, but this step is still to be enjoyed because that's ultimately your whole life consists of the step you're taking at this moment. There is never anything else. Maybe I could ask you a question because you mentioned Ram Das. <clears throat> Many of you may know that he had a devastating stroke that impaired his speech. And what's interesting is here's an individual who's, again, spent an immense amount of time on introspection but he said until he had the stroke, he never really saw clearly, I think, or something along those lines, because it caused him to gain insights into what not only did he lose, but also uh, some of the fact that he wasn't there, and now he's very aware of being present. And this gets back to a, a, an earlier conversation, which is we see people who spend an immense amount of time on introspection, yet this issue of ego still is a very heavy burden they have, and maybe you can... well, there's the even people who are have a spiritual practice, but perhaps they meditate twice a day and so on for years. There is still very often seems to be an inability to integrate that into their everyday lives. So you can become a very good meditator. Uh, and I've met quite a few, they're, they're fantastic, they can sit still much longer than I can, and they, they, they go, they can sit quite perfectly still for one or two hours in a lotus position, which I wouldn't be able to do, and they go... <laughs> and, 
and the the example that's sometimes given there's the man doing his meditation on on metta metta meditation is a meditation on loving kindness which is you spreading your says may everybody here in this house be well and happy may i be well and happy may everybody in this city be well and happy so the you spread out the the desire for everybody to be well and happy this is the loving kindness meditation it's quite a lovely meditation and there's a man doing his metta loving kindness meditation and the door opens and his seven year old daughter comes in and says, daddy daddy can't you leave me alone? Can't you see I'm doing my loving kindness <laughs> meditation? <laughs> a, a, a typical example of not having integrated your spiritual practice into everyday life. And this is why I, I recommend uh, mini meditations during the day, just a few seconds at a time, when you, when you actually become present. So, for example, I recommend certain activities that you do habitually, why not, instead of using those activities as a means to an end, give them your fullest attention so that they become an end in themselves. For example, washing your hands. You can actually be amazed when you give it your full attention how pleasant it is to wash your hands. There is the feel of the water, very pleasant. There is perhaps the scent of the soap, there is the feeling of touch. And you may also wet your face. I do that always when I wash my hands. The cool water on your face after you've washed your hands. And then you dry your hands. It is a very pleasant and enjoyable experience. Or walking up the stairs. If you, there's a stairs somewhere in where you work or study or at home, every time you walk up the stairs, why not, instead of making it a means to an end, because you want to get to the top of the stairs, so just be aware of every step and, and just enjoy the movement of the, it's very very pleasant waiting i recommend that whenever you're waiting for something instead of waiting use that opportunity to, to and use it as a mini meditation so instead of well, waiting basically means you want the next moment but not this one this is why you're waiting <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't be waiting you would just be there <laughs> so when you're waiting for the elevator if when you're waiting it is there's something pushing you inside you that wants to get ahead to the next moment but it can't get there because the elevator isn't here and so when you push for the elevator and, and instead of waiting why not just be there totally present without straining away from the now internally wanting uh, want to get to the elevator which isn't here just be use that moment and be just become fully take maybe take a few breaths pay give attention to your breath it's a wonderful way of taking attention away from thinking when you don't want it and don't need it uh, the buddha already recommended breath meditation which simply means to observe or to feel yourself breathing and you will notice you cannot think and feel yourself breathing is either one or the other <laughs> so when you're standing in front of the elevator take your attention away from the mind in, which means it moves into the present moment take a few conscious breaths and enjoy this moment of not waiting or the supermarket checkout counter which is a source of frustration for many people well, that's where I read the inquire. The, the, the <laughs> <laughs> yes, that could be a, an escape into some kind of. Uh, it's mostly lies in there, so that's. Uh, <laughs> so these are mini meditations. I think they are very helpful. Probably, I would prefer. I believe these are more effective to incorporate many such mini meditations into your everyday life than to have separate totally separate compartments in your life one is your spiritual practice and the rest and then there's the rest of your life i'm not saying the mini meditation means you cannot also have a spiritual practice but if you want to choose either one or the other i would prefer the mini meditations because they become part of your everyday life so you're less likely to have two compartments in your life you know you, you were talking about uh uh compassion uh meta practice uh, one of the challenges for many people and one of the confounds in the neuroscience research is 
this issue of in-group versus out-group. And we understand from an evolutionary level why this has occurred, but I think to survive as a species, we have to figure out ways to expand this in-group, and maybe you can comment on what your thoughts are on how we do that. Uh, what do you mean by in-group? The people who, you have your group that you automatically feel close to or uh, love yes. versus people you've never met uh, or in fact yes, yes. maybe have no opinion about okay. or in fact maybe even dislike. Yes. How do you spread compassion, care, yes. love <clears throat> to embrace them right. yes. and then also especially people you may not like or have differences of opinion with, how do you embrace that because your response oftentimes is an emotional response. Yes, yes, that's a very important point. The, um, the one sense of self, in our Western world, most people have a predominantly a personal sense of self uh, derived from their life experiences and all forms of conditioning. Uh, prior to a personal sense of self, humans apparently had a tribal sense of self so the, the once their sense of identity was not so much based on me, it was mainly based on us. So that began with the, the tribe. It's our tribe. And when the most the dreadful thing one could do to a person, and still perhaps is the case in some older societies, for somebody to to be expelled from the tribe would be like a death sentence. Not just physically, but even psychologically, the person would virtually die. So tribal consciousness is still very much alive in humans. And this is uh, in some societies and in the 20th century, in certain time periods in the 20th century, was very strongly, very pronounced as nationalism, which, which led to the huge world wars and the madness of the 20th century. So that was really a regression to the, the tribal consciousness, which if, we, if you think that the egoic consciousness that's totally identified with the sense of the me, the conceptual me in the head, if you think that's mad, the thing that's more mad is the, the collective conscious, the collective me. So uh, it is still the case that many people can have compassion and empathy with those who belong to their group, tribal group. Which, and some people can only have compassion and empathy with the members of their family or extended family. They just cannot go beyond that. Anybody who is beyond the family is the stranger. <laughs> so you cannot recognize another as a true human being. And you still have within countries, you have certain regions that are totally, have this tribal consciousness. And then that you have the tribal consciousness that surfaces in religions very strongly still. Potentially religion is a wonderful thing and the origin of religion of course is usually there was somebody who had a deep insight into the oneness of all life and attempted to teach that to others. The, the compassion, the love to recognizing the other as yourself and yet <laughs> unfortunately mostly the, the beautiful original teaching got hijacked by the egoic mind and used for its own purposes. And now we have, as a result, to a large extent, although not completely, there are pockets in religion that are deeply spiritual. But in many religions, many religions are a divisive force in our world rather than something that unites us. And even within one, even within the same religion, people kill each other because it's another another church or another, these people don't quite share our beliefs. They believe that this thing happened and we believe that thing happened 600 years ago and they don't believe that so they must be evil. This is, happens when you conceptualize other human beings in your head. First you conceptualize your, your tribal identity, us, and you have certain characteristics. Then you have to strengthen your tribal identity by having others who do not share that the egoic self loves its enemies. <laughs> and and the, the, by the way, the personal sense of self loves its problems. <laughs> That's, so the egoic self 
defines itself more clearly by having the non-believers, for example, in the case of religions, the infidels, the, oh, they are satanic beings out there. Or some people think the whole of America is satanic. There are probably millions of people who have the weird idea in their head, America is satanic. They have never, and when, if they ever met an American, they would completely, all they would see when they hear American, there would be the screen of conceptualization, satanic, 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 and they wouldn't see you at all. They can't, they cannot differentiate between, between a, a saintly figure who is American and a, and a, a, a brutal murderer who is American. He's just American. They can't, they should just be a street. It's an incredible what the mind can do to you how it can totally obscure your perception of reality. And sometimes some Americans may do the same towards others. It could well be that you have an idea in your head, all Muslims are awful, they're just out to kill us. And then if you truly had that idea in your head, whenever you meet someone who says, I'm a Muslim, you go, oh. You could, completely, you will not see the human being anymore, but only your concept. You will relate to the other through this dense screen of, of concept, in other words, total separation. And when you do that to another human being, then it's very easy to perpetrate acts of violence because you cannot sense their inherent aliveness anymore because you have dehumanized them. They've become, the word is objectified, because they've become mental objects. And, and this, is, this, is, this all happens when you are too identified with thought. It cannot step out of thought. This is, these are the enormous dangers about being too identified with thought. So you have these collective entities, which are really extremely nasty entities. So does this just get to this issue of this pain body where you need to separate that out? Because, you know, the issue is how do you expand this group? How do you get away from that? Is it turning off this inner voice and not listening to it, uh, putting it aside? Uh, is that the key? Uh, yes, stepping out of complete identification with thinking really remains the key so that you, your reality is no longer only a conceptual reality. And you can sense, then sense, meet another human being in that sense of clear presence without imposing immediately judgments on him or her. That, and then bring, that brings it, with the, suddenly there is a, 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 something flowing between you. Suddenly there is a, it feels, it feels good to relate to another without, without the, all those obstructions. And this is where we have to go, otherwise we would destroy ourselves. If uh, there is more and more humans are able to Awaken now, I believe that, and I, I know that. There are still pockets on the planet that are very deeply, very deeply possessed, one could almost say, by the, by the tribal consciousness. And uh, those are the places that you hear most of when you listen to the news, unfortunately. Actually, we've covered a fair amount of topics. Uh, many of you have heard uh, Eckhart, uh, quote Descartes and other philosophers, religious and spiritual leaders. What many of you may not appreciate it, he likes movies. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, one of the movies which I know you've talked about is Groundhog Day. Uh, there's actually some great enlightenment uh, uh, from that movie and maybe you can. Yeah. Well, if you haven't seen, you, you <laughs> must see it, Groundhog Day. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I've seen it maybe six or seven times, and I'm sure I'll see it a few more times. Uh, I mean, just to refresh your memory, if you have seen it, and just and then explain why I love it so much, what the, what the very important message is. There is this man, uh, the protagonist, uh, the actor is um, Bill Murray. Uh, so his character is a weather forecaster, and so. He is told very, very negative. He dislikes most people. He dislikes his job. Wherever he goes, he complains and is unhappy. And that is his sense of identity. That is how he lives. So he travels to this place in, 
Pennsylvania or somewhere. And the Puskatani? Yes. <laughs> and they have this ceremony, they release the groundhog on groundhog day to see if he goes back into his cage because he is supposed to forecast how long the winter is going to last. So he he's the weatherman, so he goes there with his team, a man and a woman, the cameraman and his assistant, just to film that, but he's so, he's just so unhappy and negative, dislikes, it's an awful place here, I want to get out of here as soon as I can. What a dreadful place to be, what a dump. And these are his thoughts, not the reality, they're his thoughts, but he's, that's, to him that's his reality. And then of course he wakes up, in the, after they've done the filming, the next morning they're supposed to go home, he wakes up, the bell rings, okay, and they can't get out of town because there's a snowstorm. They have to stay another night in this dump, this awful place. The next morning he wakes up and a strange thing happens, the same thing happened to him that the previous day. And then he begins to realize that he's reliving the last day. And he's just very weird. And then the film goes on. In other words, he is forced to relive this same day. He can never get out of town because of a snowstorm. Every morning he turns on the radio, goes the alarm radio goes on and, and sings this song by uh, Cher. I got you, babe. I got you, babe. <laughs> And so it goes on and we don't know how many times he has to relive that, hundreds of times we don't see. He, after a while he gets so desperate he wants, tries to commit suicide and he does, but the next morning he wakes up again in bed. <laughs> so, and then at some point in the movie his behavior changes. He, instead of being nasty to people, he helps people. Uh, so he becomes a a helpful force and and he goes around and makes people's lives better. I think he got so bored with suffering and disliking it. So he's, and every day he begins to enjoy more because, but every day he does new things to help the people. And of course those people, for those people it's always just the first time it happens. <laughs> and uh, he begins actually to enjoy it. He cooperates with the present moment as I put it. It's never explained in the movie, fortunately, because in good movies the message is not explained. It has to be shown rather than explained. So the viewer can draw their own conclusions. And then the last scene is he wakes up and it's the next day. He can, he can, he can leave. But he, now he loves it so much, he says to his assistant, let's stay here. <laughs> <laughs> so he is released from the cycle of suffering when the, as he begins to surrender and accept the present moment and becomes a positive force in the present moment, he is suddenly released from the cycle of suffering. And so that is the deeper message that the way you, if, and so basically I would say everybody who is still totally identified with their conditioned mind lives his or her own Groundhog Day, because the, not exactly, but the conditioned mind tends to replicate itself. And if you are totally identified with the conditioning of your mind, which includes reactive patterns and so on, you tend to recreate similar life experiences through your reactions. And you tend to even to recreate similar relationships. Some of you might have noticed that uh, tend to attract certain kinds of people. How did, why this, it seems very strange, but it happens. Uh, and that's because the, the so basically, everybody has his or her Groundhog Day in the head <laughs> until they transcend it. And it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful you said that in that, because this is a metaphor for the power of compassion, if you will, because Look what happened in his life. He was self-absorbed. Everything was miserable. It wasn't good enough for him. And this is an inward placement of his worldview. It was only until he looked outward and embraced others and recognized their suffering and the power of intersecting with them and trying to relieve their suffering that he was finally released from his own suffering. Yes. And on that note, 
I think uh, we'll end our dialogue, but we do have time for some questions, unless, of course, we've enlightened everyone and there are no more questions. That's possible, too, yeah. <laughs> Other microphones on either side. <laughs> Um, I'm young, I'm restless, and I'm optimistic that I can change the future for the better. Good. But I also hear that you say that we should focus on the present. Yes. And um, while well, you talk about Groundhog Day and focusing on, focusing on the present, so then how do you bring about innovation and change yes. and not focusing on the present? Yes. I, you may remember I briefly mentioned it is important to have a destination, to have an intention, to know what it is you want to achieve in this world, how you want to improve the world, how you want to contribute to the world. It, this is a wonderful and necessary thing. So the question is whether your intentions and uh, your projects, your plans, as you begin to implement them, do they contribute to your happiness or do they generate stress? So while you are trying to make the world into a better place, you make yourself and others unhappy in the meantime, if you're not aligned with the present moment. So it is perfectly possible and really the only sane way to live, not only to have a plan and to contribute to the world, but to realize the, the, the quality in, is highly important. It's not only what you do, the quality of doing, the consciousness that flows into what you do is even more important. In other words, <clears throat> how you do what you do is more important than what you do. You could have a, you could have a store uh, serving customers with this or that, which perhaps would not be regarded as a very uh, important job and yet if that is done with a quality of presence where every customer who comes into your store you, you give this person your just an example your fullest attention you appreciate him or her as a human being uh, you see how you can best serve him or her in the present moment that is quality and then you would be improving everybody who comes into contact with you would somehow experience a small lifting in, in their being, in consciousness. And so that you could create a, even a person with a relatively, in a relatively simple job could contribute in that way to creating a better world. And if you have a huge project, this is wonderful, of course, but I would suggest or recommend that you are careful that you give your fullest attention to whatever step you're taking in the present moment towards your goal because the step is as important as the goal. In fact, the, the quality of the step determines the goal. So the means never justifies the ends. The means and ends go together. You cannot have bad means to achieve a good end. It may look like that, but give your fullest attention to the doing. See if you can be fully aligned with it so that you don't could generate negative energy because you want to create a better world. So that you create positive energy as you are about to create a better world. So it's a balance, being fullest attention to the now and yet knowing very well what it is that you want to achieve. Then also the element of creativity, you can access that much more fully when internally you open yourself to the present moment and you honor the aliveness of the present moment, you get far more insights into what, what you need to do, what is needed, and, and this may sound a little bit, I hope not too new agey, but when you are fully aligned with the present moment, you also, you tend to, when you are this positive, you tend to attract helpful factors into your, I've experienced that many times in my life, you know where you want to go, you've made your commitment, you begin to take action, joyful action, alive, intense energy may arise, but not stress, joyful action, and then helpful factors are much more likely to come in than somebody 
who may have good intentions, but is, they're so stressed about them, so I can shout at people around me because I'm, I don't, don't agree the way they do things because we're, wanting to, we're trying to create a compassionate society. <laughs> Why aren't you helping? You should be doing that. You know our goal is important. We're creating a compassionate society here. Damn what it. Is, yeah, it's, okay, so it's a balance. I'm, you have to, it's a practice also. I wish you well in your endeavor and may your life be fruitful and may your present moment be joyful. It is. Thank, Thank you. you. That means a lot. Our next question. Thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. I guess what my question for you is, how do you decipher what thoughts make sense to follow, the thoughts that are from clarity and beingness, and how do you choose when to think and when not to follow the mind? Yes, thanks. For certain things, of course, thoughts are needed to deal with certain practical matters. So there's no problem there. What do you apply your thought? What, what, what do I need here? Then there are thoughts that arise in daily life. They just come into your head. And you can notice what, how this particular thought makes you feel. So you can detect the feeling quality behind the thought. And if the feeling quality is not good, it's a bit like eating something that doesn't, that doesn't make you feel good once it reaches the stomach. It feels, oh. Uh, so there are many thoughts of that kind that, make you, that give you that feeling that is not pleasant. For example, thoughts that generate anxiety, thoughts about what's going to happen or imagining problems that might arise tomorrow <laughs> and, and believing virtually that this is a reality already. So, and this is called worry is a, a particular mind pattern that many people are familiar with. Worry means to think of things that could go wrong and how they could go wrong and how they probably will go wrong because they always tend to go wrong. So that's a very familiar thing. And then you detect, how does that make you feel? Worry doesn't feel good. If you feel in the body, it feels there's fear associated with worry. So there's anxiety that arises. You feel a constriction in the body. So when you, the feeling will often tell you what kind of thought it is, whether it's true or not. And then you, you can recognize certain thoughts as, as not productive and as thoughts that you would choose not to have if you had a choice. But the wonderful thing is that you do have a choice. And it, it is actually possible to drop certain thoughts when you recognize them as having no function whatsoever except to make you unhappy. <laughs> and there's a wide range of thoughts that has no function whatsoever except to make you unhappy. <laughs> and, but sometimes the egoic self actually even loves its unhappiness because it's so familiar. So every therapist is, is familiar with clients who do not want to let go of their neurosis because they, they feel at home with it. <laughs> so, but if you, if you recognize these thoughts as not helpful, then it's easier to, okay, don't, don't follow them where they want to take you. And by choice, you remember what we said about attention? you actually realize you, you can choose where you want your attention to go. The thoughts pretend to be all-powerful and to try to get all your attention. Say, no, my choice is not to co continue this train of thought, but to take my attention into my breathing. Oh, much nicer. A minute ago, I was terribly worried, and now I actually feel alive. And it's quite pleasant to be here in this moment. It's not a hell, I just, I thought I was in hell. <laughs> and, and, and I was only in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening and thank you for tonight. Uh, one of my favorite jokes was that uh, parents give advice to their children because they cannot be an example. So how do we help our children be present and 
separate themselves from their thoughts that we are teaching them to think yes. and well, so on. You've, also, you've already answered your question because predominantly it's not by telling them but by living it yourself because that transmits itself how the way in which their parents live is the greatest teaching for the children as you rightly said what they tell them is very much secondary and sometimes it contradicts the way they live the parents tell the child don't swear like that and the child says but you do it all the time <laughs> so if if the parents live consciously and bring more presence into life so that is the teaching occasionally they may say a word or two to point in that direction but basically the answer is already you've already given the answer yeah thank yes you. sir thank you for being here so Osho when he talks about how he reached enlightenment talks about the fact that effort was necessary but not sufficient at some point it was an obstacle yes. but when he dropped the effort uh, it happened yes. so what triggered your awareness at the age of 29 apart from unhappiness uh, in terms of the book you read the inter uh, how did your how was your day look like oh uh, it was purely triggered by suffering so i didn't make a spiritual effort to reach any kind of state it was purely what also said of course in some cases is also also applies people who have a spiritual practice and put a lot of effort into their spiritual practice while they put the effort into the spiritual practice and this is very much exemplified in the life of the buddha who had a spiritual practice for quite a, a number of years and he had several teachers and he became extremely good at every spiritual practice and be he became an ascetic monk and he stopped he only ate and drank an absolute minimum he almost starved himself to death and so he what he had a very strenuous spiritual practice and suddenly he saw this does not lead to awakening and then he dropped as you said happened to Osho too he dropped all effort and at that point the story goes that many of or many or all of his disciples left him because at least he, he has abandoned the true path <laughs> of course he had not he dropped all effort and then was able to simply enter the present moment fully. Now, the question might arise, couldn't he have done that <laughs> without the effort and just go into the present moment directly? I don't know. He, in his case, he needed the effort, and in my case, I needed the suffering. So what was, in his case, the effort, in my case, was the suffering, which is also an effort. To make yourself suffer is a great effort. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, so I've really enjoyed today. I feel like you've talked about sort of a pragmatic uh, wearing of this school of thought philosophy, which really resonates with me and I'm sure a lot of folks in here. Um, sometimes where I struggle is when I take it to, I hypothetically put myself in the extremes of the situation that, that is the complete disassociation uh, from my ego or from the collective ego. Uh, and uh, this arises in some of the work I do with, with the clients I work with too, where it's, you are not your thoughts. And that, it seems to make a lot of uh, clear sense to me on the negative side of the spectrum. I feel like 90% of today has been about the way we sabotage and destroy ourselves. Uh, but on the positive side of the spectrum as well, it may, it's a little more ambiguous for me. I think more ambiguous in terms of what I desire. Um, uh, my, my girlfriend's in the room and she can probably attest that I'm, I've become not the world's best gift receiver because I feel a sense of sort of neutrality, like a calm joy, but I'm not ecstatic. Or like I have a thought like, this is awesome, be exuberant. Instead I'm like, I am not my thoughts, like this is, <laughs> and in the present moment, this is nice. I think she should get a new boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> but anyways, on the positive side of things, uh, I sometimes wonder, do I really want to disassociate myself from well, the volatility of okay. happiness and ecstasy? Okay, well, this, uh, this, on the one hand, you have the kind of, what is conventionally called happiness is when something that is considered great happens and you go, whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa. Or sometimes people, at the slightest thing, people are given, given some object and they go, wow, yeah, 
and they really feel ecstatically this is the happiness that is connected with something so-called good happening around you, something is given to you or you attain something. Uh, and then there is something, there is something deeper that is a, a sense of, I wouldn't call that happiness, although in some spiritual traditions it is called happiness. Uh, there's something that's actually deeper than happiness. There's a, there's a peaceful sense of a life, sense of joy uh, in the background of your being. And with, when this, I'm a bit like you too, by the way. That, uh, but I don't know if that, if that is in the background of your being. But I don't go, wow, when, when things happen or I attain something or something is given. I, I appreciate it's nice. But if it disappeared the next moment, it would be okay too. So uh, there is a something deeper that is what we call happiness, because if you're happy one day, you may be unhappy the next. Happy, unhappy, happy, unhappy. Something bad happens, I'm unhappy, completely unhappy. Something good happens, I'm absurdly happy, uh, unrealistically happy, because it's not going to last. So there is a deeper sense of joyful, beingness, peaceful aliveness, is that in the background and therefore you're no longer ecstatic when something so-called good happens and perhaps no longer that despondent when something so-called negative, is that also the case? When something is taken away from you or something so-called bad happens, are you also not as despondent as you might have been in the past? Uh, yeah, I think so. I feel even keeled. Yes. Uh, now, that's, that's good. Let's not confuse that so, because some people confuse that with a sense of being like a kind of having deadened yourself to the highs and lows. This is not what we're talking about. And I've, I have met people who have done that, and they, they don't feel more alive, they feel less alive. And they feel less alive, and they, they when something good or bad happens, they go, oh, well, Mm, uh, they kind of deaden themselves to the, and they, or repressing your emotions could be part of that. Um, eventually, you transcend the emotional highs and lows because there is a deeper level in you where the highs and lows are not that important anymore. You still experience them to some extent, but they don't pull you down completely, and they don't don't pull you out of yourself completely. So. I don't believe you have deadened yourself. You seem quite alive, so. <laughs> so the girlfriend should stick with them. <laughs> so I think that we use the term equanimity, right? Where you, you, you don't get lost or try to hold on to the highs because they're always transient and you don't get lost and get attached to the lows and think She's that's all She's running out the door right now. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> she, st she still loves you. She, she still loves you. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm sorry to say we are out of time. I thank all of you so much for being here. Eckhart, thank you so much. It's been oh, a blessing. Thank you.